get started. Um, and I'm going to just hey, Ken, folks. Do you want me to help? There we go. Okay. Good evening to everyone. Um, for those who weren't uh, around for last Monday, um, we talked about slavery, uh, Jewish involvement in the slave trade, which was rather minimal. Um, there were a few, uh, but um, really not a significant number. Uh, although plenty of Jews who lived in the South did in fact own slaves. Uh, although small numbers, it was mostly an urban Jewish population. Uh, Jews were not big planters. And um, uh, of the, uh, I think the 12,000 uh, who owned upwards of 20 slaves, um, there were maybe um, a handful of, of Jews. Uh, so when we talk about Jews who owned slaves, uh, most of them, you know, were were either uh, in the household or in small businesses. There were certainly slaves in the in the urban, uh, uh, in in urban. There were approximately 3,000 who fought on the side of the Confederacy, Jews, about 7,000 who, who fought on the, uh, on the side of the Union. For the most part, your attitudes were predicated on what part of the country in which you lived. There were 150,000 Jews in the United States in 1860. Um, not a large number maybe larger than one might think, but certainly smaller than um, the, the post-Eastern European migrations that would happen 20 to 40 and 50 years following the, the Civil War. And when uh, most Jews ended up in the United States, if you were to just randomly take a room full of Jewish folk and ask them to raise their hands, if their ancestors came uh, from the, um, the original Sephardic Jewish immigrants, you would probably not get any hands, maybe uh, one or two. If you asked if they came with the, uh, the Jews of Central Europe, the German Jews that came in the middle of the 19th century, you might get a, a, a number, uh, but the vast majority of us um, have roots among the Eastern European Jews that came um, long after the Civil War uh, was over. So tonight we're going to focus on really the period uh, following the Civil War up into World War I. Um, this is the, uh, the period in which Jim Crow comes into um, its own. So a couple of words about historical background for, for those who may be uh, a little less familiar. Uh, following the end of the, the Civil War, there is a, a big debate in the North about the proper way to treat the, um, the former uh, rebels. Uh, should they be viewed as um, states that had the unfortunate desire to rebel against the Union, but in fact, had never seceded, in which case um, they you, you you can't you can't be readmitted to the union. You're only admitted once, uh, and therefore they were already a part of the uh, the country that they had never left. Or should they be treated as um, uh, as enemies, as traitors that had to uh, reconstructed and treated like conquered? territories uh, and then be um, admitted back to the Union once they had shown sufficient remorse uh, and um, 
and repentance for their, for their crimes. If Lincoln had lived, it's interesting to speculate what might have been different. Um, Lincoln was a proponent for hard war, but an easy peace. Um, on the other hand, Lincoln himself had come a long way in his attitudes toward um, African Americans and slaves. Uh, he accepted uncritically many of the, the racist attitudes that were um, common uh, throughout 19th century America. And though he was always irrevocably opposed to slavery, he believed that black people were inferior and that they should be uh, returned to Africa, that keeping um, black people emancipated uh, as um, residents of the United States, that they would always be treated unfairly, that they would not be able to compete on their own. Lincoln's attitude changes enormously uh, over the course of the 1850s into the, uh, into the Civil War. Um, and by war's end, while it would be a mistake to anachronistically look at Lincoln and say, oh, well, you know, he's just like a, like a, you know, a, a 20th century individual. Um, but if he had lived, maybe he would have gone even further. He supports the uh, 13th Amendment, which abolishes slavery. Uh, it, uh, it passes before the war is, uh, is over. Um, you can watch the film that Steven Spielberg did with Daniel Day-Lewis as uh, Lincoln and Sally Fields as Mary Todd Lincoln. Um, good movie. It really focuses in the last few months of the war and the passage of the 13th Amendment. Uh, Lincoln did not see, uh, live to see it ratified, but it had already passed Congress uh, and was well on its way to ratification since the other uh, Southern states uh, were not, uh, you know, didn't have to, uh, to ratify it for it to become a part of the Constitution. Uh, with um, Lincoln's death, uh, his vice president, Andrew Johnson, was you know, really not cut out for, for leadership. Uh, he was a staunch unionist, also uh, uh, for, for African Americans. The US Congress and Senate, however, are controlled by the Republican Party. And uh, the Republican Party was um, quite radical uh, at the time. Uh, certainly the radical Republicans led by folks such as Thaddeus Stevens um, uh, wanted to punish the South, wanted to treat the South harshly, and wanted to quote unquote reconstruct the South. So within a five year period, you have following the 13th, 14th, which guarantees citizenship, uh, regardless of color to anyone born on American soil, later becomes the basis, right, of, of, uh, uh, of due process um, for, you know, for, for equality. Uh, in, in pretty much any application of the law. And then the 15th Amendment, which guarantees African-Americans, men, not women, um, the right to, uh, to vote. By the way, since um, you know, I'm, I'm knocking down um, all kinds of cherished uh, beliefs and notions today, um, I might as well do this for, uh, for women, you know, for feminists. Um, there were a number of women, Susan B. Anthony, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, really, um, you know, foremost among those fighting for uh, the, the suffrage of women. Uh, however, when it became clear that African-American men uh, would receive suffrage, but not white women, 
um, they actually, even though they had been very strong abolitionists, uh, both um, Anthony and Stanton uh, and a number of others had horrible things to say about blacks and um, by, uh, by black men. Um, that wasn't the term that was used. Uh, it was a rather offensive term, not the N-word, but another offensive term that was used by, uh, by Stanton. So, um, you know, for us who, who sometimes have these vaunted notions uh, of people in the 19th century behaving the way that we would uh, have expected them to behave in the 21st century uh, is, you know, um, anachronistic wishful thinking. Uh, so um, that's, uh, that's one of those things where if we're looking for purity, you know, everybody's got some piece of dirt we're staying on them. So um, if you see a, a statue of uh, um, Susan B. Anthony or Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, know that they were, uh, they fought strongly against uh, black suffrage uh, for, for men because um, it was being denied uh, to them. Anyway, back, uh, back on track. Um, so Reconstruction was a very harsh and jarring period um, and a total failure. From 1865 to 1877, uh, the South was turned upside down. Now, let me, let me take one step back. It wasn't a total failure because for the first time you had African Americans able to register to vote. You had um, black office holders at the state level, and even uh, at the, uh, the national level, you had congressmen and senators representing um, Southern states. However, in order for uh, reconstruction to work, you had to have a uh, almost permanent army stationed in the southern states. Um, Reconstruction, there were, there were race riots, there was the Ku Klux Klan that had came into being after uh, the Civil War to sow seeds of terrorism, uh, all to fight against uh, this struggle for, for Black enfranchisement and, and equality. You had a white population that was absolutely categorically opposed. And if you can imagine, you go from seeing African Americans as slaves, as property, as less than human, or at best, uh, inferior humans, and suddenly, within the space of a year, um, they are enfranchised. Uh, within a space of two or three years, they are voting. Uh, they are protected by the Union Army. Um, time and again, uh, Johnson almost is impeached, but by one vote, um, by one vote he is, uh, I'm sorry, he is impeached, but he's, uh, he's not convicted. By one vote he is saved. Um, but after Johnson, uh, Ulysses Grant wins uh, in a landslide. And this is a very, very uh, difficult period for the South. Um, so in some ways, it, it was um, a, a worthwhile experiment in equality and enfranchisement. Uh, on the other hand, it's hard to see how you change hundreds of years of, of attitudes um, by stationing uh, a, a permanent military presence uh, in order to, uh, to, to ensure fairness in elections and to, to fight against uh, the kind of intimidation and terror uh, that um, uh, African Americans experienced in the uh, 12 years following the, um, the Civil War. Uh, in 1877, 
um, Rutherford B. Hayes, it's a Republican, uh, becomes president in a very, very close race. Actually, the race is tossed into the House of Representatives. And um, he strikes a deal with um, the Southern states. He will end Reconstruction and he will recall the last of the Union troops if they will support his bid for president. Uh, Samuel Tilden, the Democrat uh, who was from New York, uh, was, had, it was very close. It was razor thin, uh, the margin. <coughs> and whether it was a Faustian bargain or not, that's what happened. Rutherford B. Hayes uh, got the votes of the South and he promptly withdrew the last of the Union troops and abruptly reconstruction came to an end. Uh, all of the Republican parties that had controlled uh, every single Southern governorship and legislative house um, almost overnight all fell. They all returned to the Democratic fold. Uh, in, in the 19th century, the, the Republicans were the party of, of liberation and of um, abolition, uh, and the Democrats um, were not. <laughs> in any event, so with the end of Reconstruction, there is a pendulum effect. Um, and within a very short period, within 20 years, the system of segregation that is often called Jim Crow, um, Jim, Jim Crow was a, uh, the, a, a uh, name of a song that was popular in the South um, and became identified um, with, uh, with segregation. So Jim Crow was the legal and cultural disenfranchisement of the Black community, right? We're, we're perhaps most famous with the Supreme Court decision in 1896. Uh, by the way, after, after the Civil War, there was no um, segregation formally. Um, it's only in the 1880s that uh, little by little segregated facilities begin to, to become systematic and, and the norm. But in 1896, uh, there is a famous Supreme Court decision that would stand for uh, 58 years, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson. And in it, separate but equal becomes the law of the land. It was never equal, but it sure was separate. And it is there that school systems, um, transportation, hospitals, um, you name it, a any kind of, of, of public accommodation um, became um, subject to the, the laws of segregation that were passed in um, every single Southern state. And also became the norm in private businesses. So that um, various um, segregation ordinances um, also uh, obtain to, uh, you know, to, to um, bathrooms and restaurants um, and to department stores, um, anywhere that uh, you had um, public, uh, public access, even if it was, in fact, private commercial property. So where do Jews figure into all of this? Uh, obviously, there are uh, Jews living in the South. Um, we don't really have much evidence about what the relationships were between those Jews who owned slaves uh, and um, their uh, slaves uh, after, uh, after abolition. Um, I mentioned a couple of instances where we have some record, but what I do want to talk about is the idea of whiteness, uh, not as a um, skin color, 
Um, there is no such thing as whiteness. None of us are really white. Um, but as a, a social construct, because that is really what whiteness is for the, the, the South. It is a perception. There are people who are black who looked white, right? So you had people who could pass. So were Jews white, quote unquote? Now, some might say, well, what are you kidding? I mean, you know, I look at a Jew and it looks quote unquote white to me. But again, whiteness um, is something that uh, is race in general um, has an element of, it's a social construct. If we, if we uh, also equate race with certain genetic elements, it's because over the course of time, you have Jews who are marrying other Jews, and that creates um, a kind of you know, genetic map uh, for those who are Jewish. And the same is true in the African-American community. But we're going to be talking about white as a kind of cultural construct. And the extent to which Jews conform to that or didn't conform to that in the, in the eyes of themselves and in the eyes of others. Um, if we had more time, I would talk about how Jews in 19th century America often referred to themselves as a race. And we have all sorts of documents. Now, race, they meant a kind of national group, a shared culture, uh, shared history, language, um, a kind of tribal affiliation. But the, the word race, the Hebrew race, the Jewish race, uh, is a term that is used uh, by Jews in the 19th century, um, as well as by non-Jews. So I wanna just uh, quote um, from um, a speech that was given by Thomas Dixon. Right? Does that name sound familiar, Thomas Dixon? Well, Thomas Dixon was an author um, his most famous work is a book called The Klansman, a novel. He wrote a bunch of novels at the turn of the 20th century. Um, the Klansman is a sympathetic depiction of the, uh, the original KKK and um, was turned into a movie. W.D. Griffith really, you know, um, uh, path breaking, I mean, it really was in terms of cinematic technique, uh, even though the movie's theme is, is you know, um, pretty scurrilous. Uh, um, the Birth of a Nation came out in 1915, uh, you know, a full length feature film glorifying the Klan as defending, you know, white womanhood, white, uh, white Southern heritage, um, really reeking of uh, the, uh, the lost cause uh, myth. But here's what Thomas Dixon had to say about Jews. And this was in this speech before the American Book Sellers Association, 1903. Race prejudices of two kinds, he said. Um, the, the comparison of hatred of the Jew to that of the Negro uh, is worth bearing, right? Race, he's talking about race here. Hatred of the Jew was a mean thing, according to Dixon, which exists simply because the Jewish race is the most persistent, powerful, commercially successful race that the world has ever produced. It was, or it is an example of unfair and petty jealousy to be a prejudice against the Jew and not a matter of self-preservation. Thousands of them have been assimilated by America and thousands more will be assimilated. Millions of them may be swallowed by our Germanic race and that will not change your complexion but you can't swallow a single N word, 
without changing your complexion. So here, it's very interesting that Dixon is being complimentary to Jews. He's saying people are prejudiced against Jews because they're fearful of their superiority, but that's not what we should be fearful of. We're fearful again of, about African Americans, about blacks, because um, they will mongrelize and destroy and undermine our white, our white society. But in in making this invidious comparison between Jews and blacks, he is distinguishing Jews as members of a race. Now here are some things that you probably you know don't know. Jews benefited from whiteness, and because they were imbued, not all of them, as we will see. I'm, I'm starting, you know, with, with the bad stuff, and I'll work my way. We'll end with the good stuff. That was a rabbinic, rabbinic uh, dictum. Always start with the bad and end up with the good. Um, so many of the attitudes of Jews in the, uh, in, in the Jim Crow, post-Reconstruction South, um, are mirror images of the racism that you will see and identifying with whiteness as much as possible. So um, Bernard Baruch, Bernard Baruch, um, who goes on to be an advisor to Woodrow Wilson and FDR, uh, he was a great financier and philanthropist. If you um, grew up in New York, there is a Baruch College that is named after him. Um, he was a highly assimilated Jew, highly assimilated. He married a Christian woman. Um, he was, uh, you know, when, when asked to uh, support um, Jewish causes, he, you know, was not particularly in favor. Um, he writes, though, his uh, autobiography called My Own Story. He came from South Carolina, and he was the son of a Klansman, a Jewish Klansman. There were a small number of Jews uh, who participated in the original KKK. A and I'm going to emphasize the original KKK because the KKK changes dramatically. It goes out of business at the end of Reconstruction. Uh, I, I mean, you know, it has it's been successful. Um, all of the Reconstructionist ideals are, are tossed in, out the window. Uh, segregation is in place. Uh, terror is in place. The Klan doesn't have to exist. So the Klan slowly dissipates after the 1870s. It has a resurgence in the, in the 19-teens. Right? In 1915, the Klan is reborn, and that Klan is virulently anti-Semitic. But the original Klan of the 1860s, late 1860s, uh, that Nathan Bedford Forrest, after whom a Jacksonville school was once named, um, who was the founder of the Klan, um, their focus was exclusively on African Americans, not on Jews. So a very small, very small number um, of of, uh, of Klansmen um, were Jewish. And in fact, Bernard Burrich writing. Uh, in the in the 19 teens, uh, didn't seem ashamed of this. There were uh, a number of other Southern Jews who uh, belonged to an organization called the Red Shirts. Nothing to do with communism. Uh, the Red Shirts um, sought to restore the rule of Democrats in the South by intimidation and violence. People like um, Edwin uh, Moyes and um, H. H. DeLeon. Right. These are, by the way, uh, good Sephardic names. These were original. Uh, these were not Eastern European Jews come south. These were from the uh, original Sephardic, the quote unquote, uh, Jewish aristocrats uh, who came um, in the uh, actually before the revolution. Jews uh, in the south identify with the myth of the lost cause. So Jacob Nunez Cardozo, um, related to a distant relative of the Cardozo who one day would become Supreme Court Justice, in his uh, autobiography, Reminiscences of Charleston, uh, written after the Civil War, 
quote, there was a species of patriarchal relations in the mode of life when surrounded by his household slaves in that reciprocity of protection and obedience that exists between master and servant. He writes about the good old days. Um, Edwin de Leon, a uh, Jewish Confederate from Colombia, uh, who uh, actually was also a Confederate diplomat in Europe, um, compared and contrasted the oppressed industrial workers of the North, right? He said, these Northerners are horrible, they oppress their workers, but slavery, and this is all written after the Civil War, it's an apology. Uh, slavery worked for the mutual benefit of slaves and owners. It gave the former clean cabins, plenty of food, medical help. Uh, and he writes in his uh, reminiscences, reminiscing, uh, the slave was a purely animal creature who showed a spaniel-like affection for his owner. Pretty, uh, pretty hor horrible stuff. What was interesting is that whereas today, uh, very often we like to underscore parallels between the Jewish and the black experience, like around the story of the Exodus in Egypt, and we talk about uh, you know, Negro spirituals like you know, go down Moses, uh, this was not the view of, of Southern Jews. Um, so when Booker T. Washington, right, founder of the Tuskegee Institute and um, not a proponent of integration, uh, he was uh, a supporter of social segregation, but he wanted to see economic enfranchisement. He was very into the idea of African-Americans pulling themselves up and becoming, um, financially independent, um, forget about political enfranchisement, he focused on the economic. He, he believed, he didn't talk about this loudly, but that if blacks were able to economically achieve independence and affluence and influence, many of these other things would, would follow. So Booker T. Washington is writing at a time when there were lots of lynchings, happening in the South, but there are lots of pogroms happening in Europe. And in fact, he compares lynchings and pogroms in a uh, speech in St. Louis in 1906. But the local Jewish paper, The Modern View, editorializes that, quote, it was a poor parallel between Negroes who by carnal crimes bring their people into disrepute, and Jews who are feared because they are too acquisitive and too able commercially, professionally, and otherwise. This notion of identifying African Americans with Jewish suffering was something that um, the, the newspapers of the Jewish newspapers of the South did not want to countenance, right? They're looking to take advantage of their whiteness, culturally speaking, or the compatibility of their Jewish race, quote unquote, um, with, with whiteness. The Jewish ledger of New Orleans um, went even farther, calling uh, Booker T. Washington, this is in September of 1905, an impudent N-word to compare the Jew who occupies the highest pinnacle of human superiority and intellectual attainment with the Negro who forms the mud at its base is something only a Negro with more than usual vanity and impudence of his race could attempt. Right, so that's from a, uh, a Jewish um, newspaper. Um, I wanna just, I'm gonna bring up on the screen, let's see. It. Find it. Okay. Ah, here we are. Uh, this is from a Jewish newspaper, another Jewish newspaper. See if I can uh, bring it up now. Here we are. This is from a newspaper called The Jewish South. Okay. Uh, it was published in Richmond, 
in uh, the 1880s into, I don't know, how far into the 20th century. Let's see if I can make it bigger. Okay, um, in 1898, there is um, a, a, a race riot um, and an attack on Jews in Wilmington, North Carolina. It's one of the few outposts where there were still some Republicans and a group of Democrats, um, Southern Democrats, um, engineer a coup uh, that not only throws all of the Republicans that had protected the African-American community um, out on their ear, but actually it was an affluent uh, black community and goes in and um, um, you know essentially riots, uh, destroys property and a number of people are killed. The Jewish exponent, right, a Northern Jewish newspaper, which I think still exists in Philadelphia, um, finds a parallel between the persecution of the Jews. Excuse me, Rabbi, does still exist. There you go. And uh, the persecution of the Jews and the recent political disturbances in North Carolina. Okay. So this is being written from um, Richmond. Um, Let's see. To begin with, the struggle for white supremacy in North Carolina was not a race war. It was simply an organized effort to exchange a bad government for a good one. Uh, much the same as was done by a band of rebels in the city of brotherly love some 122 years ago. Very often um, in, in the lost cause, uh, the civil war is compared to the American Revolution. Now keep going at the bottom here. But it is in comparing Jews as citizens with Negroes that the exponent does the greatest wrong. Our people, though persecuted and driven from pillar to post, do not possess the criminal instincts of the colored race. Numerous though our faults may be, crime is not a distinguishing trait. A careful lifelong observation of the Negroes compels us to admit that education has made them more immoral and dishonest than the preceding generation. Gratitude is an unknown virtue, and the more the whites give them, the more they expect and demand. We have repeatedly seen cases where a Negro would rob the person who was dispensing charity to his entire family. The colored man is a much less desirable citizen than the Indian yet he has received much better treatment at the South than the latter did in the North. There is no case in the history of this section where a white took such an undue advantage of a Negro as did that great and good man, William Penn, when he purchased the entire Keystone State for a string of beads and a paper of tobacco or something of about equal value. Right, uh, you get the idea, okay? Um, and there are lots of newspapers that, um, that we could point to with, with these kinds of, 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 uh, of attitudes um, in them. Perhaps we shouldn't be surprised, right? Um, why would we expect people living uh, in the Jim Crow South uh, to to be significantly different than their fellow, you know, white um, Christian uh, citizens. And equally important, and I think this is really the, the, the most important part, is that Jews themselves were very marginal and constantly looking to find acceptance, which in their mind was not by allying themselves, with African Americans who were disenfranchised and discriminated against and powerless, but with the white power structure. And Jews themselves, as we'll see, um, had something to worry about. The Jewish population in the South grows, uh, not 
not you know as exponentially as it does in the north, but um, there are Jews that come south from the north. There are also, as immigration kicks up, not all the Jews end up in New York. A number are funneled uh, to other parts of the country. Um, some actually even, a small number, come through Galveston and then disperse in other parts of, of the South. But um, there is a widespread financial panic followed by a depression in 1893. And what happens is that Jews begin to experience anti-Semitism in this time of economic marginalism. After the depression of the 1890s, even when the economy begins to uh, recover, there is a period that's called um, the New South, the growth of the New South. It is a time of industrialism, right? Factories come to the South. Many of the trends uh, that um, were already going on in the North and had been for two generations. And the factory system and industrialization in the South displaces many of the agrarian ideals. It undermines families. Um, it creates a kind of new urbanism where people uh, who are in need of work are, are leaving small town life, leaving their agrarian roots behind and coming into the city. And with this dislocation um, comes a lot of uncertainty and hostility. And some of it is laid at the doorstep of Jews. Which brings us to um, perhaps the single most famous case of discrimination um, uh, against a Jew in, in the South. And that is, of course, Leo Frank. Leo Frank was born in Texas, but he grew up in New York. And uh, he came down uh, to manage a pencil factory in Atlanta uh, in the, uh, the early years of the, uh, uh, of the 20th century. Uh, in 1913, he is accused of the rape and murder of a 13-year-old employee, Mary Fagan. Now, what's um, amazing is the African-American janitor, Frank Conley, testifies against Frank. And it is on the basis of Conley's testimony that Frank ordered him to help uh, get rid of the body uh, that uh, Leo Frank is convicted. There are mobs outside of the courthouse. The jury only takes four hours after this trial to, uh, to convict um, Frank. The Jews across the country uh, are, uh, are galvanized by this. Um, this is one of the things that actually uh, helps to form the ADL. Um, the American Jewish Committee, Louis Marshall and other, you know, Macher German Jews from uh, up north um, get involved. To, to, uh, to, to get representation. Um, what happens with Frank, though, is kind of a mirror image of, of what happened without much fanfare uh, with lynchings all across the South, right? Between 1880 and 1920, there were roughly 4,000 um, African Americans who were lynched, mostly men, but not always. I mean, then there's some horrible, horrible stories that I will not repeat. Um, and many of them were um, were public celebratory lynchings. These were not done by a small group in the middle of the night. They were uh, perhaps undertaken by small groups, but then the bodies would be displayed. People would come from miles around uh, to take souvenirs of clothing or actually even body parts. Um, photographs of, of lynching victims were sold for, you know, a, a nickel, a photograph. Um, Frank really stands as a counterpoint because of the publicity that he received 
I mean, this was this was in the national in the national news. Um, it it garnered a tremendous amount of anti-Semitism from various disaffected elements. Um, perhaps most famously, one of the great uh, Southern populists of the time, Tom Watson, who once upon a time was not a racist, uh, was actually uh, quite progressive, but had become embittered uh, over the years and certainly was uh, a, 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 a foe uh, of industrialization in the South. And um, he is sentenced to death, Frank, but um, his, uh, his sentence is um, commuted to life by the governor, John Slayton, because Slayton believes that he is actually innocent. Uh, just fast forward, um, evidence uncovered many, 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 many years later, long after, you know, Leo Frank was eventually pardoned. Um, there is evidence that implicates Jim Conley. And it was obvious in you know why it would uh, be in his advantage to uh, to point um, a finger at um, at Frank. Um, but be that as it may, uh, Slayton's political career is ended by his courageous act, if not pardoning him. Um, he might have been lynched if he had pardoned him, but commuting his sentence. But eight weeks later. Uh, Frank is dragged out of the prison and in a scenario that, again, happened uh, 4,000 plus times, uh, is, is hung from an oak tree in a Marietta, Marietta, Georgia, uh, a, a largely, I mean, a, you know, a, a, a suburb with um, a significant Jewish population today. There is a, uh, a uh, historical marker um, where, uh, where Frank was, uh, was lynched. And it was one of these celebratory public um, um, hangings. Um, I'm going to uh, actually play a little bit of a song. So well known was um, Leo Frank's lynching that um, it was turned into a popular folk song in the South. And if you go on Google Play to, to this day, you can hear it. Uh, it's called The Ballad of Little Mary Fagan. And I'm gonna play uh, just a, uh, a little bit of, of it for you to hear. Little Mary Fagan, she went to town one day. She went to the pencil factory to get her little pay. She left her home at eleven when she kissed her mother goodbye. Not one time did the poor child think she was going there to die. The old Frank met her with a brutally heart we know. He smiled and said, little Mary, now you'll go home no more. He sneaked along behind her till she reached the metal room. He laughed and said, little Mary, you met your fatal doom. She fell upon her knees to Leo Frank, she pled. Because she was virtuous, he hit her across the head. The tears rolled down her rosy cheeks, the blood flowed down her back. She remembered telling her mother what time she would be back. He killed little Mary Fagan, was on one holiday, and called for old Jim Conley to take her body away. He took her to the basement, bound hand and feet. Down in the basement, little Mary lay asleep. Mutely was the watchman when he went to wind the key. Down in the basement, little Mary he could see. He called for the officers, the names I do not know. They came to the pencil factory saying, Mutely, you must go. They took him to the jailhouse, locked him in a cell. Poor old innocent 
nigga knew nothing for to tell. I have a notion in my head when Frank come to die, he took examination in the courthouse in the sky. Astonished at the question, the angel said it say, why he killed little Mary upon one holiday. Come all of you good people, wherever you may be, supposing little Mary belonged to you or me. Her mother said to weep it, she weeps and moans all day. She prays to meet her baby in a better world someday. Judge Rowan passed the sentence, you bet he passed it well. Solicitor Hugh M. Dorsey sent the old Frank to hell. Uh, so the Ballad of Mary Fagan is uh, is still out there. Now it, it's true that Leo Frank was um, certainly the only Jew uh, that we know of that was was lynched at a time when thousands of African Americans were. On the other hand, the kind of animus and anger that was occasioned, uh, the hatred that it stirred up, um, showed that. The Jewish position in the South was um, was a lot more ambiguous than um, might have otherwise been thought. Um, there's a great book which just came out a couple of years ago by uh, a professor at Harvard, Carolyn E. Light. It's called uh, "That Pride of Race and Character: The Roots of Jewish Benevolence in the Jim Crow South," and her thesis is that um, Southern Jews developed one of the most sophisticated and cutting edge network of charities in the South, right? For Jews to take care of their own, um, to, to ensure that Jews would never be seen as a burden um, and that Jews would prove themselves to be exemplary white citizens, right? that Jews could be you know, looked upon as, as models. Um, and indeed, uh, if you read about the, uh, the Jewish orphanage um, that was established in New Orleans and another in Atlanta, especially the one in Atlanta, um, they were doing some amazing things at a time when orphanages were, you know, um, children sleeping on, on cold stone floors. So um, as, as Light points out in her book, um, there was a sense of, of wanting to fit in, wanting to blend in, a sense of, of, of ambiguity um, and ambivalence. And that is something that characterizes Jews who uh, either know better than to speak up, speak out, or those who try to, uh, in a chameleon-like way, um, take on, um, you know, to, to uh, out Southern, the uh, the segregationists, but there are also Jews who identify with um, with African Americans, especially on an individual basis. Right, there are those who see the plight of of blacks in the South, and um, who extend themselves um, in 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 ways that the vast majority of white Gentile Southerners um, would not. Uh, Jews in um, in retail, for instance. Um, here are just a couple of examples. Julius Levin, he was a prominent lumber merchant in uh, Alexandria, Louisiana, uh, who made generous donations to the uh, African-American Shiloh Baptist Church. And in fact, when he dies in 1910, um, the statewide church publication for the Black Baptist Church uh, called the Louisiana Baptist, called him a true friend of our race. Uh, Jewish merchants, merchants in Montgomery um, develop a strong rapport with Booker T. Washington and uh, become um, prime supporters both financially and in terms of supplying goods to uh, the Tuskegee Institute. Um, 
There is a boycott at one point in the early years of the 20th century uh, of Tuskegee and a lot of pressure on white merchants, including white Jews. Um, but uh, Jacques Loeb, he's a French born Jew who uh, headed a large grocery concern in Montgomery, um, refuses to, to, uh, to give in uh, and actually plays a role in breaking the, the boycott. And of course, um, there is Jewish clergy, a small but significant circle of Southern rabbis. And we're talking now in the, at the height of Jim Crow in the early years of the 20th century, um, who supported black education, who opposed lynching and who worked for quote unquote interracial harmony. These were not people who were trying to uh, turn over the apple cart and, and undermine the, the status quo. But they were trying to chip away in, in, in certain areas um, at some of the more egregious aspects of Jim Crow and of lynching and of violence. You have folks like Rabbi Ephraim Frisch of Pine Bluff, Arkansas, Rabbi Bernard Ehrenreich, of Montgomery, um, Alfred G. Moses of Share Shemayim in Mobile, uh, Rabbi Seymour Bodigsheim, he's the rabbi of Temple B'nai Israel in, in Natchez, Natchez, Mississippi, who invites George Washington Carver uh, to speak from the pulpit, um, who in 1908 would be inviting George Washington Carver or any other um, black figure to speak from a uh, from a local pulpit in the South. Rabbi Max Heller of New Orleans actually went considerably more out on a limb and being vocal in the larger community. In fact, um, he uh, is quite loud and vocal in his criticism of a local uh, toy drive for Christmas, interestingly, uh, that was only collecting toys for white children. Um, but he wrote into the local newspaper and made his views um, known. Now, these might be seen as small gestures, but again, you have to look at the context. And so these individuals who were fighting um, against the status quo in small ways were also a part of the story. And I think it's very important that we, uh, that we bear them in mind. Finally, um, the last thing I would say, and then we'll open it up, you know, I'm sure there are comments, questions. Um, Eastern European Jews who came down to the South at the end of the 19th and the early years of the 20th century, many of them coming from Russia or other places where they had suffered discrimination, um, the Eastern European Jews who came down with many of the, without many of the same preconceptions, um, often found themselves um, um, more socially comfortable and more uh, well disposed toward African Americans, and more likely to um, to view um, some of the discrimination that they faced through the lens of what these Eastern European immigrants who were now in the South um, had faced themselves um, in, in choosing to leave um, Eastern Europe behind and you know, some of the, 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 the most murderous anti-Semitic violence that took place uh, under, uh, under the, the, the reign of Tsarist Russia. Um, and so, even within the Jewish community, you, you see uh, there is a, a wide uh, variety of, of uh, responses. So let me stop here. And um, if you want to, I saw that there were a couple of um, things on Zoom. So let me try to, on the group chat. Uh, can you explain the relationship between Reconstruction and the Union Army placed in the South? 
Reconstruction was the program of um, the radical Republican Party that, you know, the, I mean, I say radical, they call themselves radical Republicans, just say Republican Party. Um, it's not a, you know, it's, it's actually a descriptive term of history. It's not a subjective term. So we'll just say the Republican Party. The Republican Party was very much um, uh, pro-emancipation, pro-enfranchisement. They controlled Congress. Uh, they did not seat, uh, Andrew Johnson had a plan to seat, reseat Southern uh, states. Um, the Republicans said, no way, Jose. And they had a much, much more um, stringent approach. They treated the Southern states as conquered territory, as enemy territory. So Reconstruction was their program uh, to root out um, former Confederates, uh, to, uh, to put into place those who were um, loyal to the Union and to the Republican Party. Um, Ex-slaves clearly saw that their interest <laughs> lay with the Republican Party. And the Republican Party also saw that their interest lay in, in uh, promoting the rights of former slaves. That would keep them uh, beholden to the Republican Party. So Reconstruction was the, the program that was largely imposed on the white South. Um, and it was the, the only reason that it, that it could work was that it was enforced at, uh, at gunpoint by, by, Southern, by, by Union troops uh, who stayed in the South after the Civil War, who was stationed there. So um, Reconstruction was the political program. Uh, what what enabled uh, the the government in Washington to enforce it was the presence of the Union Army, and it was that army that was removed in 1877, part of this smoky room deal uh, between Rutherford B. Hayes and um, uh, Southern Democrats. Um, let's see. Ah, okay, Jews as a race. Okay, so. Um, the term race as we understand it now is not the term uh, that was understood um, uh, in, in, in the 19th century. Um, ethnicity is probably not the right word. The idea of race was something vaguely biological, vaguely. And the whole doctrine of scientific racism, it, you know, grows in the 19th century. Um, but it had to do with um, attitudes, um, traits that were believed to be ingrained, um, things that were inherently part of Jews were, were intelligent, right? It was because of their racial characteristics. If Jews were smart or if Jews were good with money, um, or if Jews were adaptable, um, this was all in part because of their character as a race. It was the sum of all those things that differentiated you from um, another group. The term didn't have a specific scientific uh, definition, um, not then and, and, and not now. Um, but that's the best that, but Jews did, you know, refer to themselves as a race. Um, but then again, I mean, so, you know, so did others, uh, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a pejorative term in and of itself. If you hated the Jewish race, well, I guess you were anti-Semitic. Um, if you admired them, um, uh, you still thought of them as a separate race, but you were, uh, uh, you were well disposed to them, like Thomas Dixon. Um, the Nazis didn't invent the, uh, the, the comment, uh, the, 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 the concept of, of Jews as a race. Uh, they just made it an absolute centerpiece, uh, bolstered by all of this pseudoscience, uh, that they could bring to bear. Uh, but, but, um, the, the founder of, of racialism was a fellow named Arthur Gobineau was a count, actually French, who lived in the um, early 19th century. And so in some ways he was the father of, you know, race, racialism. 
Um, but but yeah, the Nazis took it to new heights. But no, they didn't invent it. Okay. A little girl is dead by Harry Golden. Okay. Um, there's also a uh, uh, a good book by Leonard uh, Dinnerstein, the Leo Frank case, written uh, it's a historical work, uh, published by the University of Georgia. This came out a bunch of years ago, um, but it has uh, it's you know pretty uh, pretty thorough thorough book. Right. Um, thoughts, comments? Yes. Could I Absolutely. jump in here, please? Absolutely. Um, my mother told a story that I have never forgotten. First of all, you've got more than a few people on here whose parents were, came from Eastern Europe and settled in the South, and we were raised in the Jim Crow era. Mm -hmm. um, she told the story. She lived in Pensac near Pensacola, Florida, in the Panhandle. And she said that this young black boy was lynched. She doesn't know why, but the railroad was very important then. And the stations were only about 15, 20 miles apart. They took that body of that young boy and hung it on the telephone pole at each railroad station and took the children out of school and walked them down to see it. She said that was one of the most traumatic things that ever happened to her. Oh, I'm sure. I, there, there were other, I mean, there were horrible, horrible stories. Um, I, I'm actually going to, you know, be doing some traveling in the next week to various sites uh, of, of civil rights interest. Um, one of them is uh, Mariana, Florida, also out in the Panhandle, where... Uh, one of the last public spectacle lynchings took place of a fellow named Claude Neal, who was left um, um, hanging from uh, an oak tree in the courthouse square. And when the sheriff took the body down, there was a near riot because um, white white folks who had come from miles around weren't weren't uh, finished um, seeing it. Um, and interestingly, the governor of Florida at the time was Jewish. He was a converted Jew. He, he was from New York. Um, David Schultz, interesting guy. The closest thing that Florida has had to a Jewish governor. But he was born Jewish, went to Yale, served in the Navy in World War I, came to Florida. I don't know why. Um, you know, but he, he went to law school at Stetson lived in Daytona, married, uh, he converted to uh, Congregationalist faith and uh, married a nice Congregationalist woman. And he became, he was the governor of Florida in, at the time. And, uh, fascinating, uh, fascinating story. But thank you for that. Questions, um, thoughts? I mean, does this surprise you? Does it not surprise you? Um, Rabbi, I have a question about. Yes. Uh, um, you know, there's uh, about Ethiopian Jews and racial issues. There's been some, in fact, some <coughs> demonstrations and protests in Israel um, among Ethiopian Jews and racial issues that mimic the same concerns here. But when you go to Israel, you realize that Jews from all over the world kind of look different from each other and. And uh, could you comment on like those sorts of racial differences or appearances that um, have any relevance to this discussion or maybe it has no relevance, but. <laughs> well, Jews are not a race. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, the whole idea of race is very, um, you know, it's one of the, the the most misquoted, misused, misunderstood terms. Um, you know, I mean, they're, they're, race is, is largely a social construct, far, far more than a biological one. Um, so yeah, no Jews, I mean, in as much as you can convert to Judaism, in as much as we know over the course of the centuries, 
um, there was some blending of, of, of different people and, you know, in, in, in different countries um, that um, Jews can be blonde and blue eyed. They can um, look dark skinned and almost, uh, you know, quote unquote, like Arabs or what they used to call Orientals, which not Asian folk. Um, there are there were Jews who lived in China in Kaifeng, uh, who were indistinguishable from the Chinese. Um, I know um, um, Asian Jews. Now, granted, in those cases there were there was conversion, and but their children are Jewish. So um, you know there 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 is no Jewish race as we have come to understand what the word race is. There is no white race. Um, either. Huh. Um, so, you know, uh, is there, has there sometimes been prejudice in Israel? Sure. It's a real country with real people. Um, there has been prejudice expressed by some against Ethiopians. But honestly, the original sin of Israeli uh, uh, prejudice was. Uh, in the early years of the state against Sephardic Jews, Ashkenazim, right, Eastern European Jews, European Jews looked down upon these Jews from Arab countries and uh, treated them, you know, um, like second-class citizens. It, that's largely um, no longer the case. There's so much marriage between Ashkenazim and Sephardim, um, but that wasn't always so. But yeah, there's prejudice everywhere. Other thoughts, questions? Go ahead, Kim. You gotta, you gotta un unmute. Okay, I just unmuted. Um, so um, my question was um, about um, you had said that when Jews came from Eastern Europe and they came to live in the South, that they did not have prejudice against Black people. No, not in the same they way. they hadn't, what's that? Not in the same way. I mean, it's all a matter right, of degree. They, right. right. What about, um, and the, but they assimilated. So I imagine that some people may have developed prejudice. But what about in the North? Did they, um, did Northern Jews have a different kind of reaction to the different cultures in the United States than say Southern Jews? They had different historical experiences, but I, I, you know, so the answer is yes and no. That's a good Jewish answer. Um, it's hard to generalize, you know, so. So Jews were disproportionately represented uh, in even in early civil rights movements. So the founding of the NAACP, right, the National Association for the Advancement of Color People, um, Joel and Arthur Springarn uh, were, um, in fact, there's still a Springarn medal the NAACP gives out, um, Jews. They were on the, among the founders. Um, Julius Rosenwald, who was the, uh, um, the CEO, he was the owner of, of um, Sears, right? He was the big Sears magnet from Chicago. Another huge supporter of the NAACP. Um, radical Jews, who are disproportionately involved in, in uh, socialism and in the, um, in the early years of the American Communist Party um, were also you know, very vocal. Uh, there was a big battle between the communists and the NAACP for uh, control of, of, of civil rights in the 1920s, uh, in, in the 1930s actually, um, in Scottsboro, right? The lawyers, the Scottsboro boys, lawyers were Jewish. They were sent there. Um, and 
they were noticed as Jews and of course uh, locals uh, derided. So, um, but that being said, if I, if I say that they were disproportionately represented, that only means relative to their small numbers in the general population. That is to say among the few in general who were fighting for civil rights, Jews were disproportionately represented. That doesn't mean to say that, that the, the, that the Jews themselves as a community were disproportionately involved in fighting for civil rights. They weren't, um, they weren't. Um, and, and, and a lot of that came much later. We, we haven't talked about you know, uh, the 50s and 60s. Um, so, and, and honestly, um, you know, many of the relationships between Jews at a lower level, right? Spring Orns and Julius Rosenwald are the leadership level, but um, you know, in, in urban areas in the North, Jews were often the, uh, the landlords. They were the business owners uh, in ghettos. These were inherently unequal relationships that could easily become um, vehicles for resentment. And uh, you know, and 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 uh, and prejudice on both sides. Um, so you know, you shouldn't think that the Jews up north were were these great uh, saintly paragons of, of virtue. They weren't. Well, maybe um, also the fact that they may be discriminated against more in the south would make them feel a little more, um, you know, affinity for the prejudice that was exhibited towards the black people? Um, you know, I mean, look, you, you certainly were more likely to see editorials in Northern Jewish newspapers castigating, especially um, the, 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 the most um, horrific expressions of violence against African-Americans or making sympathetic comparisons. Um, but, you know, editorials aren't the same as, uh, you know, what actually is when the rubber meets the road. That doesn't necessarily mean if somebody puts in an editorial that um, Jews were, um, you know, running to embrace civil rights. Again, um, among Americans that were fighting for civil rights, Jews were disproportionately uh, represented, but not necessarily in the larger Jewish population. When, when Jews were more successful, they left ghetto neighborhoods. They didn't stick around to uh, mm. uh, to to say, "Well, let's let's help improve." Um, mm. You know, redlining. Uh, these kinds of practices happened, and Jews became more affluent. Uh, Jews are like Americans mm -hmm. in general, and um, keep in mind in the South, if they're if they're I would say that there was certainly not more prejudice uh, in the Jewish community. Um, in fact, um, it tended to be far less overt. Um, it tended to be more of an acceptance and an accommodation of segregation and the status quo, um, not necessarily a full-throated uh, embrace of it. Although again, as we've seen, there were those who, who did um, most people, you know, um, looked over their shoulder. And we'll see that especially when we get to um, the civil rights movement, where Jews were, uh, many of whom were sympathetic to desegregation efforts, but they were caught between a rock and a hard place. Rabbi, could I jump in, please? Speaking Go ahead. as a Southern Jew, there's something, Kim, <laughs> yes, that, that I don't think has been brought up yet. We lived with the blocks closer, even though it was segregation. We had them in our homes. We looked on them as family, although they were subservient. But there were many a time I wish the maid had been my mother. That's number one. And number two, in my father's business, they were our customers and we had to respect them. And sure. I was taught you are not to ever be prejudiced against these people. They put the food on your table 
And I think a lot of Jew Jewish children were raised like I was. And I think there are people here who can back me up. I that, also, that is true. In a small town in Alabama, and the Southern black community and the Southern white community were cheek by jowl. It was one community and there was so much more interaction between the two than is uh, publicly acknowledged. Yeah, that was often uh, one of the criticisms that were leveled against do-gooder uh, Yankees that came down because um, you didn't, you know, uh, th there was plenty of segregation in the North. It just wasn't legal. Uh, it was just de facto, it wasn't de jure. You didn't have signs, but you know, there were certain streets where you knew that the black neighborhood ended and the white neighborhood began, and that never the two, you know, um, ever mixed. Yeah. yeah it was holier than now when it came to condemning us. Well, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, did say that um, he thought he had encountered um, the, 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 the most intense hatred in Mississippi and Alabama, uh, but he was wrong. It was Chicago. <laughs> when we came here in the 70s, we were very surprised to find out that the Jews were the slum landlords of Jacksonville. And prominent members of the center were part of the cadre of people that owned the, the, the slum house and well, you know, um, these things happen, happen wherever they happen. Um, well, you shouldn't be surprised. It was the northerners who moved down here and, and had the slum. <laughs> I'm and, teasing. And I'm had teasing. the what? <laughs> that, that owned the slum housing. I'm teasing. I don't know who owned No, no, that. no, no, no. These were people that were prominent in Jacksonville when we came in the 70s. I know, but they may not have been from Jacksonville. And I, I was teasing anyway. I don't know who they were. But I will say that- Please don't um, name. In Savannah, I will not mention names. Good, thank you, Wendy. <laughs> in, Savannah, in Savannah, I had the same experiences that were good. I never ever was in my time there, was there ever an incident? Now, probably things later during the civil rights movement, but um, there really were very good relationships, not only between whites and blacks, but Jews and blacks in Savannah as well. So uh, until, and I can remember my parents and people saying, the Northerners are coming down and are rabble rousers and causing friction where there hasn't been any. Right. Well, you know, when, when uh, to go back to Leo Frank, um, Leo Frank's, uh, the fact that he was Jewish uh -huh. was uh, one uh, huge strike against him, but that he was perceived as a New Yorker, right? Jew and a Yankee at that uh, was another. I mean, the irony is that Frank was born in Texas, um, but he had spent most of his childhood in, in New York and so, um, you know, in general, Northerners were, um, uh, were, were, were seen as either, either hypocrites or, um, or as I shared in that editorial, I mean, you know, pretty disturbing and foul editorial, but from the Jewish South, uh, just lacking an understanding. They, they didn't understand what it was to be Jewish and live in the South. And that's true. I think that that mm -hmm. is, um, that is, that is very true. So um, any, um, I, I'd love any other you know, thoughts or you know, we will move on with, with to, uh, to civil rights. But I, you know, I, want, I, I want us to keep in mind that um, yes, there were attitudes out there that were reflected of the larger culture. Um, there were also plenty of Jews who, even though they weren't going to make waves, uh, who in their own small ways um, clearly identified and saw the plight of African-Americans through their own lens of persecution. Um, there, were, there were Jewish clergy. And, and again, I'm, I'm talking now in the early years of the 20th century. I'm not, you know, we're not even getting anywhere near the civil rights where um, there were there were rabbis 
uh, who had a certain amount of leeway, not always loved by their congregants for, for sticking their necks out, but um, rabbis who um, in one way or another sought to mitigate um, some of the more pernicious effects of, uh, of institutional racism and violence in, in the South. And as always, you know, in the day-to-day, -day, people live their lives and, you know, it, you know, for every day and for every act of violence and for every lynching, there was a day where it was just a day. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, that's got to be thought of as well. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Stephen, and then we'll, uh, uh, so we can end this um, at nine, we'll uh, try to do that. Yeah, I had done my graduate work at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Baltimore is the northern uh, in, in southern influence, but it's south of the Mason-Dixon line. Outside the university, there were a number of restaurants, and they were segregated. Only white person could go in there. One of the restaurants that I went to was owned by a Jewish couple. Then the students started picketing them and the white students wouldn't go in there unless they desegregated. Uh, this couple that owned the restaurant said to me, they were concerned about desegregating because there was a large population that would then pick at them. Uh, my brother came down to visit me and we took a ride down to Virginia, the Skyline Drive, the um, Luray Caverns. And we came about upon a rest stop, and it wasn't that many years ago, and it said, whites only. And I said to my brother, let's take a picture of that. And he got scared. I said, well, I'll leave the car running. You snap the picture, and we'll then run into the car. But these things actually happened. Sure. Oh, they sure did. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, okay. I, I'd love to hear from you know somebody else who, who grew up whether here in Jacksonville or, you know, but uh, not so much, in the, again, we'll, we'll talk more about the 50s and 60s, but if, you know, especially if, if memories or thoughts that you heard your parents or grandparents expressed, if they have been living in the South. Rabbi, Rabbi. Marvin, I don't know Miami counts, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, Miami counts, believe me. <laughs> We, uh, we, we, Check out. we were the South before we were the North. Uh, That's true. <laughs> that is true. It is true. Uh, I'm very surprised by some of the remarks I've heard from some of the people tonight uh, about Jacksonville and about the people in Jacksonville. It, it has a history. It has, a, it has there, there's knowledge here. Uh, old time Jacksonvillians are not speaking out uh, who grew up here. They know who's who, they know names, they know who made money off of the blacks. You have to understand that for the most part, Jewish merchants were the only ones that would service the black community. They went into the black uh, section where they lived and they opened stores uh, the Chinese did as well, uh, but mostly the Jews, and they're the ones that were the people who had the little uh, stores. Seven Eleven. That weren't Seven Eleven. They were grocery stores. Or, yeah, including, uh, including my parents. Uh, a, including my parents who had a small grocery store. In the, uh, That's right, Margaret. Yes, of course. I know. I know that, and it was that, that way all over the South. It was in Miami, and it was here in Jacksonville, and it was elsewhere in Lois, you know it. Everybody knows it. We know who's who, we know the names, we know who was, who was involved, we, we know who owned the property, and who collected the rents, and we know all of that stuff. But for the most part, the Jews were good to the black community, uh, African-Americans as they're called now. And uh, they're called now. Pardon? 
They're called, they prefer blacks now with a capital B because not all um, oh, boy, so black people are African. I agree with that. I agree no, with that. I've read that recently, that that is preferred um, reference. Well, it, should, it, it really should be. I, 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 well, I've said that for a long time, but then I've been out of step, I guess, with, 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 with uh, modern thinking about all that stuff. Uh, Hey, you were ahead of your time. You were ahead of your yeah, time. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll <laughs> add one more thing to this little, little conversation here, and you can think about it for next week. There is no such animal as justice. We have a legal system in the United States. We do not have a justice system. It is a misnomer, and think about that for this week. Oh, Marvin, I'd love to hear you talk more about that. We may have, uh, Marvin, would, we may have to have would, you do a session. <laughs> I would love to have him do that. If you don't do it on Zoom, come to the Coves when we do our lunch with Lois one of these days. I wanted to give you a little anecdote, Rabbi. I don't know if you were here or remember Gertrude Peel. Did you no, know her? I well, did not. She, did not she was a very, very lovely African-American woman, very active in education and I think her family was part of the family that has the um, the very large um, um, uh, for uh, funeral home but anyway she would always tell the story unsolicited about how the Jewish merchant in the confectionery store this was in Springfield that when she was being harassed by other kids the only safe haven she had was to run into the store where the owner was jewish and he always protected her and gave her some candy and and she said it for herself but i had the feeling that she wasn't the only one that um that he and i don't even know who it was she just always mentioned that there was a gentleman that owned the store i, I think it's fair to say on an individual basis um, folks in the Jewish community tended to, especially when it didn't require um, putting out big banners, marches, um, but in quiet ways of extending, you know, respect and tolerance to African Americans, whether as neighbors, customers. Um, <laughs> you were more likely in, in a Jewish store. Now, there are also Jews that own large department stores. When we talk about um, during the civil rights movement, um, the three biggest department stores in Little Rock were owned by Jews. Um, the biggest department stores in Atlanta, especially Riches, which was the uh, really the premium uh, department store. Uh, so th these were not mom and pop stores. These the, these no. were these were flagship uh, stores. But and Steinmart uh, and uh, well Steinmart too. Um, but um, you know this was in the mom and pop stores. You would African Americans, black people would be addressed as Mister and Mrs. Mister and Ms. Um, they were more likely if you were in a white store. Uh, and again, see, I'm saying white store versus Jewish store. Uh, you wouldn't be allowed to try on uh, clothing. Um, and in small ways, again, there there are myriad stories. And those who grew up hearing those stories know far better than I. So I don't want to, you know, presume I'm I'm a carpet bagger. Uh, <laughs> but they also but, extended uh, credit. That was another thing. They extended credit to the black community. Oh, sure. Well, that was also just a good, you know, it was a business decision, a good, yeah, you know, but, I mean, you know, aside it from was, the moral aspect it, of it. But it makes sense. I'm talking about the mom and pops. If you didn't have a dime for the, for the Coke or the RC Cola and a moon pie, they mm -hmm. said, bring it to me when you have it. So, uh, yeah, and you had, you know, individuals, again, I, you know, I remember when I first came, to Jacksonville, um, I think probably in the, in the first year I was here, um, Dr. Price, may you rest in peace, passed away. 
And um, one of the things, or maybe it was Dr. Fleet. I'm not Fleet. sure. Dr. Well, no, they both passed away when I was here. And I, I'm trying to I think of it. Two, I think one was 2005, one was 2007. But anyway, it was maybe it was Dr. Fleet. Uh, who had very deliberately, um, you know, it was the accepted custom to have two separate waiting rooms, one for black patients and one for white patients. And he put his uh, black waiting room out of commission by turning it into a file room. Um, and, you know, these were, again, small, but courageous acts of saying, you know, I'm not going to go with the flow. And, and uh, in these sorts of ways, the, uh, the status quo wasn't necessarily challenged, but you had Jews who said, you know, in whatever way I can, um, I don't want to participate. And uh, lots of stories like that. At the coast presently, is a pediatrician who was at Shands, who when he took over the department, was told there was a pile of records for blacks and a pile of records for whites. He grabbed the pile of records and he mixed them all up. He said, there's only one pile of records now. Yeah, yeah for him. That's right, and he oh. lives at the Coves now. So, you know, there are, there are lots and lots of these well, stories so now. I would, um, um, I don't know if the Institute of Southern Jewish History has um, done oral histories, uh, you know, recordings, uh, but it, um, I, I sure hope somebody has it. There's actually a tremendous amount of scholarly material on, um, both blacks and Jews, and um, and I'm looking right now. I have a whole bookshelf, uh, as well as um, a growing number of uh, of Jews and whiteness and race and Southern Jewry, uh, and it's it's fascinating to see where attitudes line up with the larger society, but also where they don't. So you know, I I think the only generalization that we can make is. Don't make a generalization. So um, with that, I'll I'll, uh, um, I'll bid everyone uh, farewell, and um, I'm always interested in uh, you know in anecdotes and and in stories. Um, Hello. We'll also, we'll also be talking um, not Hi. next Monday, but in two weeks. We will talk. Excuse me. We will talk about um, some of the, uh, you know, the tense moments and the violence against Jewish institutions uh, during the civil rights era, including the Jacksonville Jewish Center. Yep. So, um, with that, we'll say good night. Good night, Rabbi. Good night, Rabbi. Good night, Rabbi. Good night, Yes. Good night, all. Hello. Have a good night, folks. Good, good night. night. Good, night. good night, everybody. Good I night. love Tove. Good night. Don't good forget night. the Hadassah book review tomorrow at 11. Oh. Another okay. paid commercial. Good night. <laughs> Unpaid commercial. Good night. Unpaid.